Hello, listeners. This is Arthur. Today's episode is about Alabama. Here are some facts about Alabama. Capital of Alabama is Montgomery. The largest city is Birmingham. Alabama is the 30th largest state in the country. The population of Alabama is 4,860,000. Country. The minimum income of Alabama, 44509 dollars 47 in the country. The governor of Alabama, Republican Keith Ivey, and senators are Republican Richard Toby and Democrat Dub Jones. Alabama sent seven celebrity interpreters to the U.S. House of the upper centers. Six Republicans and one Democrat. Bye, y'all. Hey everybody, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. I'm here with my co-host Sophie. Hey Sophie. Hey, hey. And as you heard from my three-year-old giving you Alabama stats, this episode is about the politics of Alabama. On the line with us right now, we have two people in Alabama who are working on the ground, getting people elected. So we have with us Lori Feldman and Kayla Sloan. Hello, Lori and Kayla. Hi. Hi. Could you guys tell us a little bit about who you are, where in Alabama you are, and what it is you've been doing with politics? Well, I'll start. And this is Kayla. I pretty much am born and raised in Florence, Alabama. I left when I was like a kid for Illinois, and then we, my family moved back. So I'd say I'm pretty invested in Alabama politics. I haven't been necessarily as involved until 2016, like a lot of other people. But that whole debacle, as we all know, the presidential (laughs) race, really, I guess, set me on fire to get to work. And then Alabama actually had the opportunity of having a special election for senator because our other crazy old senator left to work Mm -hmm. with Trump. So basically the Doug Jones, the Doug Jones race, groups like Indivisible, those are what got me started. So we've been working with that ever since. Lori's got a completely different story. (laughs) (laughs) I moved here several years ago, and I lived in, I grew up outside of D.C. in suburban Maryland, and then I lived in Chicago, and then I lived in Brooklyn, and then I lived in Florence, Alabama. And we're up in the northwest corner, and the area is called the Shoals, and I found that it very much was a big contrast to my my misconceptions about what living in Alabama was going to be like, and much to my delight, this is pocket of progressivism. There's art here. There's incredible music. We have a great musical history here. Mm -hmm. And really, honestly, in a few years, I'm hoping that Florence becomes the Austin of Alabama. (laughs) Florence did go blue in the Doug Jones election. So there's a lot of fire now in this town, at least. And it's spreading outward. (laughs) Yeah. Are there any universities or anything in the area? What's what's driving the yeah. sort of progressive, more more blue leaning? So weirdly enough, it's not so much the students that are driving the action of the progression, but a lot of our older retirees. So, yeah, I would say that a lot of our driving force of progressive voices in the community have been our older retired community. And I think it's because of the history of our area kind of has like a union Democrat history that they have since left, but there's still a lot of that sentiment here. I think, though, having the university lends itself to bringing in other progressive adults and students to just give the town more that feel. But as far as like the the workers, the people on the ground, it's our older folks, honestly. So you guys worked on the the Doug Jones race. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Were people who were working on that, it sounds like at least some of them were sort of working in political action for the first time? I would say that that's an accurate characterization. I think that 
you know, following Trump's election, there was a lot of secret Facebook groups and lots of discussion amongst people who were identifying as more progressive publicly than they were willing to before. And it's a challenge here because the word Democrat is absolutely... A A little bit of a dirty word. It's a dirty word. (laughs) And so, um, you know, you'll refer hear us refer to it as like, you know, progressive (laughs) because Mm -hmm. that's a much more acceptable word. But yeah, but people were starting to connect and seeing that there were other people in the community. But prior to that, there really was not a good incentive for people who had progressive leanings to really out themselves because it would, you know, it hurt their business or. And it was, it was almost like, why try? We're not going to win. Yeah. So I think that with Doug Jones, a lot of people saw it as like, here's our chance. If we're going to be heard, it's now. Mm-hmm. And I think that that, that sentiment and people, like, when the first person showed up, it showed their friend that, like, oh, wait, she believes how I believe, and we've never even talked about this. Let's work on it together. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's really accurate. A lot of people were very surprised with the amount of people we had to show up for us and to, to canvas and to make phone calls. And it was this really exciting time that has continued to this day where people have felt more empowered to speak and to act on their beliefs. Yeah, we're actually, we're having a March for Our Lives this weekend, and that's something I did not think our town would have done two years ago. I feel like we've heard similar stories from people who are in other sort of predominantly red areas about how post-2016 election, they've discovered that there have been more people than they thought who are progressive in our community. I think the the outrage, (laughs) it was... It was too. Mm-hmm. It was too much to keep quiet. Therefore, you found out what your neighbor thought, and you found out you think the same. And we can all come out together. <laughs> yeah, that's what they were saying for the Doug Jones thing. In our across the state, really, the whole yard sign thing, people's obsession was really because it was an assertion of your own commitment to this idea that was underground. And so, seeing your neighbors having a Doug Jones sign was like a big outing. It was like a big statement to your community. And so it was, you know, a lot about the yard signs, but (laughs) that really ended up being a thing that was very influential and showing people it's okay to believe this way. (laughs) One thing we've heard some about Alabama that we haven't encountered as much as we've been talking to people in other states is that even the very progressive people seem to often be connected to churches. Is that true also in your part of Alabama? Yeah, I would say less maybe with younger groups like like me. I don't I don't go to church, but I know that most of our volunteers when we like a lot of time when we needed something, we'd make an ask or something, they'd be like, Oh, let me let me check my church or we should pass out flyers at this church because this church is more democratic leaning. So yeah, even the progressives not all went to church. I won't say all churches were progressive by any stretch at all. But <laughs> Yes, definitely not. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. But we did have a lot of the Democrats that believe in pro choice and equal rights and all that stuff, a lot of them still go to church. It's really complicated. Because <laughs> there is a disconnect between being a Democrat and being a Christian because a lot of people don't they see them as mutually exclusive. Right. But that's not the case when you get down to the individual, obviously. And it has a lot to do with which sect of Christianity, which is an interesting thing about this area, is that you, know, you have a lot of like, you, uh, by the way, I'm, this is Lori, I'm, I'm Jewish. And so this was a fascinating thing when I moved down there. <laughs> I was, first of all, I was like, they're going to hate me. And they were actually very nice, <laughs> at least to my face. But there, there is, much to my surprise, I was raised in a way that I thought uh, there's, there's Muslim and Jewish and Christian, but no, no, no. I got here and there were a million kinds of Christian and <laughs> a lot of them don't like each other. And they think that one of them has figured out the right way to worship God and thinks that everyone else is going to hell. And, <laughs> and you know, so, but then there are, so there's a whole range of Christian here and a lot of- Episcopalians are great. Episcopalians <laughs> too. And, and, and Unitarians. And, but what's interesting is church is a big part of their culture and their lives but um, only when you get the more extreme sects does it dictate their politics, per se. And I think when it does dictate it, it's really tied in. In fact, yeah. there's a lot of from the pulpit, okay, our church is going to go for this person. And, mm-hmm. you know, especially in local politics, it entirely is crucial what church you belong to that determines what kind of support you're going to get. And so I think so much of life is centered around the church community that you belong to. 
like your group of friends. And so what that, for me personally, my social groups are completely all progressive. And I don't think I'm very, fr- I, I don't have many friends at all that I would classify as like Republican, which is, yeah. you know. I often say like, I live in Alabama, which is totally red, but I, my friend group, I live, I live in a bubble. Like, I don't, I don't know any Republicans really. I mean, I know them, but they're not people I go to the bar with, you know. It allows us to interact with people that we are also working with alongside to make change. And so Mm -hmm. it's kind of a really fun social situation for progressive people here. And we found a lot of cool Republicans actually through the Doug Jones race that were like, you know what, Roy Moore is too much for even me. So I'm (laughs) I'm switching teams for this one. And we think that that might help us in the future, get them to switch teams a little more often and not see it as such a stark difference. Yeah, I think what the Doug Jones campaign did for us here is gave us a frame for speaking about the issues that really matter to people. Because it's what the Republicans are in the state legislature, especially, are very much about introducing legislation based upon hot button issues that's going to bring out their base. So they can go home to their districts and be like, hey, look, I voted for pro life day. And, you know, that way they will be reelected. And so our legislature wastes so much time on these hot button issues that they don't really get to the issues that really, really matter to people. So we've been able to use the uh, Doug Jones's frame of what he called kitchen table issues, which is education, healthcare, and job growth, economic growth. And those are the things that are important to Democrats here. And that's what we're fighting to reach out to people of both parties to explain that it's not so important that you vote party line. What's important is you vote for someone who's energized and is going to go to Montgomery and be a voice to fight for you. So that's, I'm, I'm a campaign manager for a state house candidate. And really that's, that's our big angle is that we're up against, you know, an old white man who has had a Republican supermajority for eight years and has done like nothing with it for his people in his district. And that's kind of, the way it is for lots of the people in the legislature currently who have the power. And as Democrats, our best thing is that we have this energy and we have this desire to go out and fight for the things that are important to people here. And so if we're able to get past the whole party line thing, that's our goal. Is that getting traction, the the kitchen table issues? Are people responding well to that? An Alabama Democrat is a lot different from a New York or a Chicago Democrat. So (laughs) you kind of have to be a little bit more middle of the road anyway. So I think with Doug Jones pushing the kitchen table issues and presenting them, not when he talks about health care, he doesn't say free health care for everyone because I'm a Democrat, blah, blah, blah. Although we all believe that. But the way he presents it is just like you care about if if your kid needs to go to the hospital and you can't afford it, that's something we all care about. And like, uh, what are the, the jobs? Like, it's not just job creation is not something that just the Republicans get to claim. Democrats work on that, too. So I think that him bringing these things were just very much shared issues with something like, for example, we live on the Tennessee River and the river is the lifeblood of our area. It is it makes this area beautiful. It brings in bass pro fishing tournaments that brings millions of dollars to our area so like when we talk about an issue of like regulations or ways of keeping our river clean and keeping our water supply untainted by pollution from businesses in our area um, we're not talking about it as tree hugging environmentalists we're talking about it in terms of dollars and cents because it hurts our tourism dollars when we can't draw things like the pro bass fishing tournaments because our river has turned orange you know what i mean so you know and we can we can message in terms of like surely we can all get behind wanting to fish go fishing and then not kill our family when we fry up our catch at the end of the day you know i think that a lot of the time we want to convince people with empathy and emotion and we want them to hear our stories and understand us but at the end of the day people vote based on their pocketbook like it's it's their money that affects them and it affects people on all sides so and and it sounds bad to be like oh it's all about money but I mean that's how you get down to the issues that affect everyone I guess kind of yeah I I think that that's really what it's going to come down to 
in this election as well. And that's why we're trying to speak of it in terms 